Will we have simple with this presentation? This one downloaded and not downloaded either? This one, I hope, you know, I gave these to that man, see how he thought he could get a tape. No, no, I said you have samples for this presentation. So I have the what? Samples. Samples, e cigarettes. Samples? No, I don't have any samples. It's a lot of paper. <laughs> No, we do have the uh, PDF file. Right? Yeah. I apologize for the. I gave Ed the, the jump drive with all those on there. And this one's on. Yeah, this one's. Yeah. The propofol one wasn't on there, so I apologize. But he's going to put it on the link, so we should be able to get that. So. I thought I would do like a five minute thing on this e, e cigarettes and vaping. So I started going looking for some things, and pretty interesting. Like, this is really kind of a hot topic right now in regards to electronic cigarettes and vaping. And then I wanted to see, you know, these people are obviously coming in our office. I think there's uh, there's millions of these kids using this stuff. Uh, and I think it's even some adults. So um, it's not like we're not gonna see these people. You know, I think sometimes we put blinders on just like, you know, we don't sedate people on it that use uh, THC or, you know, smoke marijuana or either. So we're done with it, you know, so just kind of curious. So if someone came in, what would we do? And we'll talk a little bit about it. So, so you know, this is va the vaping thing. It's like a big fad now. Um, some of the students told me that this is really, really big. So I thought, well, let's take a look at it with, in conjunction with anesthesia. Um, so there's a huge increase in uh, e-cigarette use um, introduced in 2007 to the U.S. market. And um, there was a lag regarding e-cigarette use and health effects and monitoring policies uh, through the um, F FDA and things like that. When you look at these e-cigarettes, they vaporize uh, poly polypropylene or polyethylene glycol, so essentially antifreeze uh, and vegetable glycerin-based liquid solutions, which are carrier agents, uh, and then they have certain flavors to that. And then the other thing is that not only in addition to this, the flavors that they can put um, CBD, uh, cannabidiol oil, and THC in there. So for the ones that are kind of pirated type of uh, 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 cassettes that you use for these. A lot of these things are made in uh, you know, back alleys, or, uh, and I'll talk about they arrested two guys in Wisconsin. Um, but they have THC, but when they do this, there's a lot of other impurities in there too that we'll talk about too. This is what they look like. Started out as a simple disposable cigarette. Um, had some cartridge in here where it would heat up with a um, heating device, and then they would inhale it, produce the vapor. Now they went to the medium size tank devices. Now they have these large size tank devices, which are the ones you see people kind of holding and uh, has a battery, has a vaporizer, uh, has a canister. And um, the latest one is this one here that looks like a, uh, like a jump drive. So um, uh, th these are the jewel type cigarettes. And uh, um, this is the most popular one, 2015, most popular e-cigarette. About 70% of e-cigarettes sold in this jewel. And um, uh, they have different flavors. Uh, cool Mint, uh, Virginia Tobacco, um, it's just a creme brulee and mango. So you get the multi-pack here with this. Um, and um, uh, the uh, younger people that use this, they say they're not vaping, they're, they're actually dueling. So it's not really vaping, they don't consider it vaping. But it looks like a jump drive and then you have the, you switch out these little canisters and you can smoke whatever you want. So I guess if you took it to school and said, oh no, this is just for my computer, I'm not, I'm not smoking this. But, uh, this is from my computer. So they, the FDA sought to regulate some e-cigarettes in regard as a drug delivery device, especially because um, they're getting nicotine and other things in there. Uh, and they can also deliver these pharmacologically active substances. But there was little success in regulation in, uh, in the 2014 rule to regulate these as a tobacco device because it really is not considered to be a tobacco. So where does it fall? So in 2015, Congress attempted to uh, exempt any e-cigarettes or, uh, it was overrun by Congress in 2015, and they exempted any e-cigarettes marketed prior to 2007 for pre-market review. Um, so they also had great neglect on uh, you know potential use by minors. So um, these uh, things were um, you know our majority are being sold to to high school students uh, and even uh, even middle school students when you go back and look. So there's a large population of, uh, of younger people that are using these, and I'm sure. They're coming for pediatric dental visits or to get their wisdom teeth out or whatever. So, so uh, you know, we're, we're encountering these people, but I think you have to now put another question in. Do you use THC or CBD? Do you actually use e-cigarettes or vape now? So that's another question we need on our health history. So 
one more thing to look out for. So when they look at this, there's no standard uh, for level of additive dosing, toxins, contaminants, uh, or evaluation of carcinogens in uh, e-cigarettes. So, um, you know, what level of, uh, of nicotine you put in there, no, it's not regulated. So, because um, they're not, uh, not considered cigarettes or smokeless tobacco, so there was no ban on advertising, so they heavily advertise these things. And when you look at the CDC, use of e-cigarettes by high school students, it increased ninefold from 1.3% to 13.4% in four years. So you can see, you know, about a 10-12% uh, increase over four years. So this thing is gaining popularity uh, more than even traditional cigarette use. So um, there's three major companies that control 70% of the share. I think it's uh, Altria, I think uh, Reynolds, and um, uh, there's one other, uh, um, the, uh, that's, I can't think of it. Um, uh, yeah, Philip Morris that controls it. So, so big, big, uh, you know, market, big money maker. Um, so uh, with this. So, you know, then, then you start seeing this stuff on the news where people are running into issues with these e-cigarettes and vaping, and there's been some lung injuries and even some deaths with this. So, Trump comes out and, and, and on, uh, on September 19th, and he bans flavored e-cigarettes uh, by this, and the big issue, that's fine, I think that's perfectly fine, but what about the ones with the THC in it, so the legal ones that are on the black market, so there's no control over that, so that's you know, what ends up going on is they're using more of these illegal ones than the ones that are sold in stores. So if you look at e-cigarettes, there was some thinking that, hey, I'll use this e-cigarette and I'll get off traditional cigarettes. So um, what they found, there's no effective data to confirm e-cigarette use to quitting smoking. Um, two random trials show little efficacy in e-cigarette use for smoking cessation. Um, and 90% of participants are still smoking at the end of the study. And the big thing now is that a lot of people that say, hey, I'm gonna to go to e-cigarettes, they still smoke conventional cigarettes and e-cigarettes, so the, the harm is actually even more with that. Um, so they're also used as a um, convenience uh, situational type of device because again, you can hide these things, you can put them, you know, you can light them up just for, uh, you know, 10 seconds, you can put it away. Um, so they're very convenient to put in your coat pocket or whatever, you don't have to keep it lit and things like that, so you can kind of hide these things. So maybe some people are doing it on a plane or wherever or even something like that. An e-cigarette nicotine has really has been determined to be a gateway drug. So thinking was, hey, I'll go for my cigarettes, I'll start to use an electronic cigarette and I'll get off my cigarettes when the reality is that I'm going to use my cigarettes and actually uh, vape with an e-cigarette too. So um, so the large majority of patients that are uh, that use and smoke and think they're going to get off this, again, they're not are going to end up using both. This was from the Winston-Salem Journal, 2015. This is um, Susan Cameron, uh, Reynolds America, and she said that her e-cigarette use would be a game changer, uh, and uh, that the, she's expecting big, big money returns from this. So now the big thing that you look on the uh, on the uh, on the news is that um, there have major class action suits against all these people with all these e-cigarettes, Juul, uh, Blue e-cigarettes, uh, all the other ones. So. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody else stock and I'll even have to get rid of it because they're going to have some major, major issues with this. So, uh, kind, of, kind of a shame. And I think the big attack mode is going to be that, you know, minors are using these and there was no control over it and, uh, you know, uh, no control over minors using it. So how do they work? You know, there's a cartridge that you put the uh, liquid in. The liquid has nicotine in it, has other flavors in it. Uh, it has a carrier, um, which is usually some type of oil. Uh, and uh, usually there's some uh, glycerin in there uh, and usually some uh, some type of uh, uh, polypropylene uh, glycol or ethylene glycol or something like that and it has a heating device that heats the liquid up. These heating devices are not real effective so they don't really, uh, they can create a vapor but sometimes they don't vaporize the entire uh, oil in the uh, in the cartridge so that can be problematic and then there's power source to power the heating device in that and usually there, there's an LED that when you, um, when it turns on you can see the LED with, with that. So again, they went from the first generation cigarette ones that looked like a cigarette to the second generation pen style with a vaporizer in there, longer battery, um, a bigger atomizer. Now they're into the third generation ones um, that um, you have control over the power and airflow uh, systems. And this is where the big issue is refillable uh, uh, containers or cartridges for these things. And there's a lot of pirate ones out there, so they're putting THC in them uh, with it. And then other issues, there's a wick in there, so there's some cotton to act as a filter, and then there's a coil, 
and the coil is actually what heats up and actually vaporizes the, uh, the liquid. And then the coil has some nickel chromium in it, canthal, which is um, uh, 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 chromium, uh, I think it's uh, tin and I think iron or something like that. So uh, nickel and chromium, when you look at it, are carcinogenic with that. And they also produce these microparticles, which once they go into the lung, they're absorbed by the lung membrane and they probably don't come out. Um, there's also silica in there, so you can end up with silicosis. So if you look at this, so a lot of known issues with uh, with the coil and uh, other parts of the cigarette um, that can end up in the lung and cause problems. So with the e-cigarette liquids, you know the components. There's flavoring. There's nicotine of some varying concentration in there. The glycerin, the uh, propylene glycol as a carrier agent or solvent with it. And then you know, does it have THC in it? That's the real big question. So. The ones with these lung injuries, they're finding that it has, actually has THC in it, so that can be problematic. And the nicotine level, like I said, there's really no uh, control over that. Um, some of these can be really concentrated nicotine levels, um, sometimes you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 uh, percent more than a cigarette. So we talked about with the lithium battery, there's explosion and burn issues with that, so it can be in your pocket, it can actually blow up, or you can actually be inhaling it. And uh, Paul showed me a picture um, of, a, of an oral injury where there was a burn uh, to the uh, lips of mucosa. So, um, so you know, the whole thing can just uh, blow up on you um, and can become like a, uh, like a fireball, basically. Um, the heating coil, um, again, has this nickel chromium or this uh, chromium uh, aluminum uh, iron alloy in it. So um, those are all issues, and those have been found in uh, microparticles in the lung. Uh, other metal components, copper, um, um, silver, zinc, tin, lead, uh, and these all leach into the uh, e, uh, liquid cigarettes and create these metal nano nanoparticles and end up in the lung. And once they're in the lung, they're probably not coming out, so you would have some degree of damage with that. Um, the liquid, we talk about vegetable glycerin, polypropylene or propylene glycol, nicotine, possible THC, and other flavorings with that. This vegetable glycerin, now they finally have come out, and I have a slide in here where they think this is really kind of a problematic part of being the carrier, especially if they're putting THC in there because what they try to do is maximize the uh, amount of liquid in there um, and uh, the carrier is not broken down completely and ends up going in the lungs as an, as an oil, so that's problematic. One of the things when they went back and looked, you know, there were theater workers that used vegetable glycerin and uh, propylene glycol to create fog when they were doing uh, productions and they looked at these, these, uh, these theater workers and they had some documented environmental, environmental lung disorders um, same thing, they found the same thing with diacetyl for butter flavored popcorn. When they went to these places that made this, some of these uh, workers had similar environmental lung issues with this. So, um, you know, when you create these, these chemicals, you know, there can be um, damage to the lung epithelium uh, and endothelium uh, and can be issues with that. So um, this uh, worker related exposure, certainly a uh, very similar situation to the e-cigarette contamination uh, with THC. These two guys came up with a, with a scheme, these two brothers came up with a scheme, and this, they're from Wisconsin, where they had these cartridges and they had like 10 people sitting in a, uh, in a apartment building, uh, and they were filling up cartridges, you see there's thousands of cartridges, and then they were selling these for like 14, 15, 16 dollars a piece, uh, and they're selling somewhere three to 5,000 a day, so um, they're making somewhere in a, you know, 40,000, 50,000 dollar a day range, so not a bad cottage industry with that but they were adding THC to that. And then the other thing was that, that of course, these weren't made under ideal uh, manufacturing conditions. There were a lot of impurities in there. Uh, so there's people are vaping this stuff, these illegal cartridges, you know, things like Sour Patch and other names that appeal to, to kids. And they're getting all this debris, um, this oil in there, and all these metals and things like that. So they arrested this 20-year-old accused of running a counterfeit THC vaping cartridge operation selling three to five thousand a day, sixteen dollars each. So if you did four uh, if you did four thousand a day, that's uh, roughly like what sixty thousand dollars a day. So not a bad not a bad industry for two brothers. So uh, so um, but then they went back and um, at, at this point it said it's unclear whether the products were related to the lung illness, but the incident underlying authorities uh, warning about using suspicious vape products. So um, you know where you're buying the vape uh, obviously juice is, a, is important, you know, where you're getting it from. And again, most of these are, are, are backstreet or uh, illicit production with THC in it. The e-cigarettes and fire explosions, again, uh, 195 incidents of explosions, uh, 
between 2009 and 2016, 133 acute injuries, 38 injuries were considered to be severe. So when these things blow up, there can be problems. 121 fire and explosion, uh, some develop when they're in use or even in the pocket. So if you have coins in here, rubbing up against this, you can press up against the button, you can heat the heater up and then this thing can blow up or catch on fire. So uh, these things are considered to be flaming rockets. So the FDA, you know, to be uh, good in what they do, they consider some uh, vape safety recommendations. So, uh, you know, consider uh, using vape tool safety features like a lock on it on the uh, on the heater. Keep your vape covered. Don't let it come in contact with uh, coins or loose items in your in your pockets. Um, never charge your vape with a phone or tablet charger. Don't charge your vape overnight. It could overheat and blow up with that, and replace the batteries when they get damaged or wet. So, thank you, the FDA. They have warned us about this. So. So when we look at the nicotine risk from e-cigarettes, again, nicotine we know comes from tobacco. It really is a true gateway drug for other addictions. It does provide some feel good um, with it. So when you use it, again, you get you know that, that kind of mood elevation with it and it's reinforcing addictive properties with the, with the nicotine. I did see a chart and I, I wanted to put it on here, but when you look at um, damage, physical damage with uh, drug use, illicit drug use, and then uh, addictiveness, if you look, um, heroin has actually had the most physical damage and addictiveness, and I think if you look, um, cigarettes or, uh, or um, nicotine was right under uh, heroin in regards to addictiveness, so it's a very addictive drug, very hard to get off of uh, nicotine. I, I don't smoke, but um, you know, you talk to smokers, and uh, smokers, uh, very difficult to get them to quit, so you say, hey, I'm going to do an anesthetic on you, we'd like you to quit smoking, you know, your chances are probably, you know, I, I think, um, uh, Mark Twain said quitting smoking is the easiest thing he's ever done. He's at least done it 20 times or something like that. So, hundreds. Uh, so, you know, said hundreds pretty, times. pretty interesting with that. It does reach the brain in 10 seconds after inhalation. Serious health risks under the age of 25, especially with secondhand exposure um, with pediatric patients. So, smokers or vapors, again, um, you know, when they have kids or children uh, or these people with these developing uh, brains, uh, and you know, these young people are using it, these high school and these middle school students, again, there's impaired brain development in young, so complete human brain development is about 25 years. So when they look, there's actually damage to areas where related to attention, learning, moods, impulse control. So, you know, just what we want more unstable uh, teenagers, you know, just what we need. So, big issues with that. When you look at the e cigarette use, the e cigarette people um, will take uh, extended puffs on these, so their puff duration is actually longer, so they're getting higher chemical concentrations of exposure to these irritants than traditional smokers. And there was little data of effect on lung. Obviously, we know that there are effects now because, again, most of these things are respiratory related. Uh, oral mucosal gingival irritation or inflammation from these, again, because these toxic chemicals are coming through the mouth, so we can get this inflammation from it. Uh, and this increased recent surge in e-cigarette related lung injuries and or deaths. Um, and again, it's probably from higher concentrations of nicotine, possible THC, heavy metals and other toxins, and due to the carriers of flavor. And one of the big things they found out, they don't really know what's happening, but you're mixing all these chemicals together. And when they look at the pro products that are produced by this, um, some of these are really toxic. There's a lot of aldehydes and even formaldehyde formation by chemical combinations in here uh, when these things are vaporized. So if you look at the risk, pneumonitis, pneumonia, tachycardia, GI pain, nausea, uh, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, seizures is another unexpected thing is environments from exploding devices. So a lot of, a lot of issues in regards to the use of these, um, uh, use of this e-cigarettes and vapors. This was from 2015. So this lady wrote this, um, she's an MD, PhD, and Masters in Public Health. So she wrote it in 2015 for the World Health Organization, a systematic review of health effects of electronic cigarettes. So I did find this out there, and um, uh, it was you know, pretty interesting to go through some of this. So when she looked, um, you know, the, the, the toxic effects of e-cigarette vapors and carrier solutions of human lung epithelium was five times the potency of conventional cigarettes. So all these things in a vapor, um, again, very potent and uh, very toxic to the lung epithelium. Uh, so that can be problematic. So when they looked at e-cigarette induced cell changes on the lung, inflammatory oxidative stress on the lung, increased cell aging, and apoptosis where the cells just explode. So um, certainly nothing good from these toxicity, from this toxicity issue. And then the other thing they saw is loss of lung endothelial barrier function. So again, a lot of these things on the endothelial barrier is getting 
um, kind of destroyed. So a lot of them are permanent damage. So obviously you're going to have problems oxygenating and um, CO2 and oxygen exchange issues with that. Uh, increased cough and mucus production, reactive airway disease, bronchoconstriction, increased airway uh, resistance. Just what Ed talked about. So we're getting these asthma-like symptoms with this. When they also looked, there was increased platelet aggregation, which increases risk of cardiac MI or uh, vasoconstriction in the coronary arteries. So certainly issues with that uh, in, in conjunction with platelet aggregation uh, and uh, increased heart rate and blood pressure from the uh, nicotine uh, effect on the heart with that. So this is a little thing I got off the internet and they talked about different things. This is the dual one that they talked about. Um, you know, this was e-cigarette and youth, what healthcare providers need to know. And I think right in here it says, this is from 2014, I think, and it said um, since 2014. Um, 2018, CDC and FDA showed, a, showed more than 3.6 million U.S. youths, including one in five high school students and one in 20 middle school students were uh, this past month had used e cig in the last time in the last month had used e cigarettes with those uh, within that time frame. So a lot of issues with that. So nicotine, and then there can other be other issues with THC and things like that, heavy metals, and obviously. Um, so again, obviously, healthcare providers want to um, advise the youth, and obviously, they need to consider stopping that. This was from Politico. <clears throat> so the feds, I think this was in September. Um, I think it's September 6th of this month. Feds say best to stop vaping, especially marijuana, as lung disease deaths rise to five. So, in, uh, on the 9th of uh, uh, 6th of uh, September, there were five deaths with that. Now, obviously, there's much, much more. I go to Children's Hospital, so we'll get uh, email alerts from them. And um, this was a uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health. And they talked about update on outbreak of lung injury associated with these cigarette product use or vaping with that. So um, they talked about health advisory and they talked about this uh, Dali um, e-cigarette and vaping associated lung injury. So that's what they call this with it. Um, as of October 1st, more than 1,000 cases and 18 deaths have been reported by the CDC. Um, so that with e-cigarette use um, and is increasing. The things that they talk about um, that they shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, fatigue, weight loss. Again, there's weight loss issues with this for whatever reason. And then when they do imaging, they would see uh, bilateral perihilar infiltrates and a ground glass opacity with peripheral scar uh, sparing of that, uh, with that, of the, those effects with it. Uh, and they weren't sure at that time whether it was due to a viral illness or um, some uh, issue with, um, you know, uh, you know um, depressing the immune system with that. And then when they looked at it, it's often associated with THC products. So, um, so that was one of the things that they put out. And then if you go to the CDC and go on uh, vaping uh, or e-cigarettes, they have um, some, uh, some material on that. And they have people looking at it. And they now know that it was the THC ones that are really causing problematic issues with the lung injuries. Um, and um, they're investigating this still. And what, based on reports from uh, patients having respiratory symptoms, same thing we talked about, GI symptoms, non-specific symptoms, fever, fatigue, weight loss with that. And all patients reported history of these cigarette use or vaping. Uh, and, um, and products and no consistent evidence of infectious cause has been discovered. So it's not from uh, getting a pneumonia or a viral issue or something like that. Um, so, uh, and unfortunately some deaths have been associated with this lung injury, so obviously. So again, they're, they're focusing on THC with it. Um, so again, another one's from the CDC outbreak of lung injury associated with e-cigarette use or vaping uh, with that. And when they look, this is October 8th, 2019. Um, so in a short period of time, that was 1,000 roughly. This is uh, 1,300. And um, when they looked at it in 26 deaths in 21 states uh, uh, in regards to having somebody die in 49 states, District of Columbia and one U.S. territory with people involved with injuries to that. Um, so you know, some issues with that. So the latest national state findings suggest products in THC, particularly those obtained off the street or, or <coughs> other uh, informal sources, um, uh, play a major role in the outbreak. So obviously this illicit THC uh, production and use uh, and filling up these vape cartridges is really causing the problem in regards to that. So they came up with a guide and obviously that when you do this, uh, any patients with uh, issues, pulmonary issues, um, should really consult uh, a pulmonary uh, specialist and pulmonologist 
Uh, you should eliminate other causes like infectious cardiac uh, or neoplastic. You should eliminate those as potential issues. Uh, and um, sometimes you can consult toxicology people with it. Uh, and um, when these people come into the hospital, they really uh, will do an O2 cell arm if it's less than 95 on room air, or then respiratory distress will admit those patients and um, uh, evaluate them on a case-by-case -case basis. We'll usually do a chest x-ray. Chest x-rays usually don't show much of anything on there. Um, we'll usually do a CT scan, um, and in conjunction with the 95, less than 95% saturation, um, so the CT scan will usually show some things for this uh, e cigarette or vaping associated lung injury. Um, we'll usually see pulmonary infiltrates on the chest x-ray occasionally, and opacities on the chest CT. So this is from the CDC, uh, and what they're looking at is that uh, this person's laying supine, and you can see this ground glass appearance kind of throughout the lungs, and you can see this um, these pulmonary opacities that collect um, in the pendant areas on the lung, and you can see this bronchodilation of the of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, uh, bronchial with that. So again, you get this ground glass. So it's probably a deposition of this oil that they now know is a problem in there that causes reactivity um, with the lungs, obviously. So you get this uh, ground glass opacity, septal thickening. Um, and perihilar uh, uh, fusions uh, around the uh, alveolus. So they went and looked at some of the patients that had been uh, admitted to the hospital and how they were treated. Um, so when they looked, you know, some of these patients took about a week before they had symptoms. This guy was five days, this guy was six weeks, this one was two months. And when they looked, a lot of these patients had elevated white blood cell counts, this one here did not. Uh, and when they went and looked, these patients had a lot of lipid laden macrophages in the lungs, so um, greater than 50, approximately 50, 30, greater than 75. So these, these macrophages are actually taking up some of this um, THC containing um, oils in the lungs, so it's causing a chemical pneumonitis in the lungs. So they looked at what are they doing to treat them, antibiotics, high dose glucocorticoids, antibiotics, high dose glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids, antibiotics, glucocorticoids, antibiotics alone, no treatment. This guy, other interventions, this person needed mechanical ventilation in ECMO, so this guy was intubated, and he was placed, uh, put on the heart and lung machine uh, for that. So high flow nasal cannula, supplemental oxygen by nasal cannula, so pretty common with that. And a lot um, hypoxia resolve, a lot of oxygen is discharged. So some of these people are gonna need supplemental oxygen to go home. Uh, most of them obviously have survived, so um, the long-term concerns are what kind of permanent lung damage are they gonna have after uh, they go home and after they recover completely. So this is from Medicine Net. This was pretty recent. Um, uh, the date was, um, this was from October. I, can't, I don't guess maybe I cut the date off. Uh, vaping lung uh, illness, double uh, vitamin E acetate bleeding suspect. So um, this vitamin E acetate um, was the problems. And when you look at this, and this was from Vaping 360. I didn't even know they had their own e magazine out there that you can look at. So, you know, uh, the best vapes, news, reviews, brands, learn. Um, so, you know, if you have any issues, uh, you know, if you're not happy with your, your vape pens or e-cigarettes, check in with the uh, Vaping 360. But the vitamin E acetate products and investigated THC oil in regards to the deaths, and they thought that um, the, uh, the uh, Vitamin E acetate was used as a cutting oil for hash and oil vape cartridges, uh, and um, that um, this is present in more than half the carts or cartridges sold in the U.S. And um, this has a, gained popularity as a diluting agent for black market cannabis oil products, uh, and then and it's sold across the country, um, sometimes by, called vitamin E oil, although it's not a true uh, oil. And one thing that they found is that these heating elements don't are not able to heat up the oil. Uh, to a high enough temperature where they will actually vaporize, but some of them will get sucked up through the e-cigarette or the vape device, and it'll go into the lungs and just kind of sits there and causes this chemical pneumonitis. So vitamin E acetate oil in the lungs results in an immune response to <coughs> non-infectious lipoid pneumonia. So that's the big problem that they're seeing. So this immune response related non-infectious lipoid pneumonia. So that's causing the problem. We look at e-cigarettes and vaping and nicotine. You know, it has higher concentration of nicotine, somewhere 35 to 72 percent. Traditional cigarettes um, st stimulates uh, nicotinic uh, receptors in the brain and autonomic nervous system. One of the most addicting drugs for humans, a gateway uh, drug to other 
make receptors for other drugs, easily crosses the blood-brain barrier in 10 seconds after inhalation with that. And I mean, really, there's a lot of a lot of issues with protein denaturing, uh, chromosome aberrations, uh, reduced cell proliferation, and apoptosis, so the cells kind of explode. Pulmonary uh, symptoms, bronchoconstriction, there are alpha-like uh, issues with that, reactive airway, increased mucin production, endothelial dysfunction, and a lot of neurotransmitter production, happy norepi, dopamine, acetylcholine, serotonin, and vasopressin. So when you look at nicotine initially, we know that it has a parasympathetic response where you get this acetylcholine release, you end up getting bradycardia and hypotension, but then secondarily you get activation of the sympathetic uh, nervous system and you get epi and norepinephrine release, which results in the tachycardia and hypertension, so the increased heart rate and the increased blood pressure, and this persists with hypertension. So this is really what ultimately ends up happening, so that's why we get tachycardia and increased heart rate in these patients. So not certainly anything good that we're going to be putting somebody to sleep. Consider pulmonary health risks with that. Toxic vapor accumulation in the lungs exacerbates COPD and chronic bronchitis, obviously, uh, if you have asthma too, uh, with it. So, um, big issue. And increased risk of lung cancer in some of the patients they suspect in the future going forward, especially if the endothelium or the, uh, the lung lining is, is violated. You're going to get a lot more of uh, pathogens or carcinogens into the, uh, into the bloodstream. So, when you look at the lung, um, some issues with that. Um, again, respiratory symptom now less than cytotoxicity and increased lung weight, uh, high airway hyperreactivity and in major airways, increased airway resistance. So again, asthma-like symptoms with that. Uh, host, non-regulation of host defenses, um, decreased antimicrobial uh, activity with it, decreased alveolar development, high levels of particle deposition in the uh, alveolar component of it, uh, and necrosis and cytotoxicity. So you know, nothing good from any of this. So we get this asthma-like uh, bronchoconstriction and bronchospasm, increased cough, and we end up with hypoxia, and also issues with ventilation, perfusion, mismatch. So we get acute uh, ARDS-like symptoms, acute respiratory distress-like symptoms uh, with this. So, and it's due to that micro-pneumonia, uh, inhalation of vegetable oil substrate with the heavy metal accumulation like we talked about, also damaging to the uh, blood epithelium. We get the CNS stimulant effects with it, and then tremors and the increased seizure activity with it too, and then sympathetic development, so the autonomic nervous system with it. Um, so cardiovascular effect, uh, effects, again, uh, issues with tachycardia and hypertension, increased cardiac demand with it. GI nausea and vomiting, probably due to the THC. Um, Ed talked about uh, um, uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis uh, type of uh, symptoms with it, uh, and there are some issues with weight loss, um, decreased overall body mass, so inhibits weight gain, and causes the person to lose weight with that. So when we look at overall anesthesia effects, things that are obviously going to be problematic, ventilation and oxy oxygenation, uh, reactive airways, asthma-like symptoms with that, cardiac stimulation, so it's going to increase uh, cardiac, uh, myocardial oxygen demand and things like that, sympathetic-related tachycardia hypertension. And then overall drug requirements, um, if they have decreased BMI, you probably use less drugs with, with THC. You can see that that can induce some uh, some enzyme breakdown of, uh, of the drug, so we might need increased uh, drug doses in these patients, really not sure. So when I was doing this, I went on PubMed, and I put in here anesthesia, an electronic cigarette use and vaping, and you can see I got zero results. So nothing, so there's nothing out there. So if we're gonna do an anesthetic on somebody, and if they don't have an acute lung injury, they're actually kind of just vaping and doing you know, kind of okay, um, you know, might not be unreasonable to put you know, do you vape on your health history? Do you use CBD oil? Do you use THC in your vape solutions? But because there's really nothing out there to really guide you. When I went and did a Google search, there was one editorial response and I found it. And it basically said that, you know, we need to be more build, more vigilant in regards to smokers and, and people vaping, but it really didn't have anything about how to manage these patients. So it was in, uh, and I went back and tried to find it again. I couldn't find it for whatever reason. So, um, so PubMed's, PubMed search, zero results, no scientific evidence regarding anesthetic treatment or experience or recommendations, and then there's overall uh, generally a lack of information regarding anesthetic management with these cigarettes or vaping. And again, we're seeing these patients. So what do you do if you see somebody and again, they say, hey, I vape. So one of the things I would do is obviously I would check, listen to their lungs, but when they listen to these people's lungs really um, with a the stethoscope, there wasn't, auscultation lungs really wasn't beneficial uh, unless they had acute 
uh, like an asthma effect type of symptom with it. So they really went more to CT scans and, and things like that. But one of the things I think you would want to definitely do is get a preoperative pulmonary clearance on solid pulmonologist, certainly pulmonary function test on it, uh, and pre-op pulmonary optimization. So maybe the patient needs some steroids, maybe they need some albuterol treatments uh, of some type with that. The other thing with the sympathetic drive related to the nicotine, uh, I think you know pre-op cardiac evaluation, certainly with an EKG, what type of exercise tolerance does that patient have? How many Mets can they handle? You know, if they're below four Mets and have exercise tolerance, you know, can't walk walk up a couple flights of stairs. Um, certainly, you know, I think they might need to be, you know, optimized by their patient uh, with that. Overall drug dose, like we talked, lower BMI, probably use less drugs. With the THC use, again, we're probably going to use more drugs. So we're going to probably, probably be somewhere in the middle with that. I'm not really sure um, with that. Use of antiemetics, uh, dexamethasone and avantitron, uh, and propofol probably for induction or maintenance with these patients certainly would probably be a good idea with that. And where, where should you do them at? Should you do them as an open airway case in the office? I really don't think so, because we had uh, acute flare-up of some asthma-like symptoms with these patients that have damage to their lungs. How are you gonna treat them? So I think they're probably better to do it in a hospital or surgical center as an intubated case. I think that would be make more sense. You can put them on bronchodilating uh, uh, volatile gases with that. And um, if you need a post-op admission to an ICU or pulmonary consultation, you should have option for that. So I think probably intubated in a hospital or surgical center would be probably a better option to do it in an open airway in the office. So I don't think these are really great office cases um, with that. So hopefully we need better screening to detect these people. Uh, cons uh, consider inhalation agents because again there's bronchodilation properties. Uh, Interop use of CO2 monitorings because again we can get that shark fin type of, uh, of um, uh, uh, capnogram you can see which would relate to having a bronchospasm so CO2 monitoring would certainly be important. Uh, benzodiazepine use, control CNS stimulation with that, and interop possible management of tachycardia and hypertension, so dexmedetomidine to do through sympathetic tone, probably avoid ketamine in these patients, because again, that's gonna cause increased tachycardia um, and sympathetic drive in these patients, so I think that would make sense in regards to doing that. And then post-op analgesic use, again, I think we wanna to try to rely on things, try to. Um, lessen our, our need for uh, narcotics because we know narcotics decrease respiratory drive with that. So uh, uh, acetaminophen, uh, NSAIDs like Ketorolac or Toradol or ibuprofen with that. But the issue becomes with reactive airway disease, we know that NSAIDs can precipitate asthma-like symptoms, so that could be problematic. Uh, lid lidocaine blocks, low anesthesia, marcaine blocks would certainly be good. Um, Expirel or liposomal glucobicane in the surgical site certainly might make sense with that. And then one of the other things is that when would these people be stable for discharge? Are they going to have any post-op issues after they receive anesthesia? And I don't think anybody really knows. Do they have a bronchospasm after they were extubated or something like that? So I think it might be reasonable for extended monitoring on these patients to make sure that they don't have any reactive airway disease after the anesthetic. And post-op analgesics, you know, avoid airways, uh, NSAIDs with airway disease, uh, possible increase opioid tolerance with uh, THC use. So. Uh, you know, so that's some of the things that we might look at. They might need more opioids postoperatively, but we know opioids aren't really good for respiratory function because they decrease res respiration, so uh, that could be problematic. So e-vaping and dental anesthesia, so what should we do? Obviously, we're going to encounter these patients. Again, how many we're encountering, nobody really knows. So I think we need better screening and check something on our health history to probably detect that. One of the things, too, if you're a pediatric dentist, you're going to get some secondhand e-cigarette and also vaping exposure to these pediatric patients. Maybe they don't smoke or vape, but their parents might, so they're going to get some secondhand exposure to that. And again, not only are you getting concentrations of nicotine, THC, heavy metals in the lungs and things like that, so they might have some residual lung damage, too, with that. And the nicotine effect um, increased with vaping and possible combined use with THC with that. So again, health history, specific questions for, and screening for e-cigarettes and vaping, because um, again, these teens are certainly using it, they're highly addicted, and again, often combined with tra traditional cigarette use. So so these people are out there, so one more thing that can put people to sleep to kind of worry about, so like we need more, but uh, so this is out there. So kind of, I'm curious to see how this shakes out, what's gonna happen long-term to these people with these, um, um, uh, e-cigarette and vaping associated lung injuries, e-valid, e are these people going to be somewhat triple, triples permanently, 
uh, need supplemental oxygen, uh, things like that. What will be their exercise tolerance, and you know how will they track in the future? Nobody really knows. So again, these could be another um, group of uh, you know patients that may have some long-term uh, uh, physiological issues uh, going forward. Does anybody have e vaping on their um, health history? You do. Good. That's good. We don't, we're, we're in school. To get any kind of change in the school is interesting. It takes an act of, uh, you know, three committees, subcommittees. So uh, I guess now we've got, I, we have to start asking people to use vapor or use, uh, uh, you know, e-cigarettes. So that's, I commend you for doing that. So that's good, I think. Because again, they're out there. And if they did, if you do see somebody with that, I think it's not unreasonable during your exam to hook them up to a pulse oximeter and see what they do, see what their exercise tolerance is, and see how they function. And if they're casual vapor, you'd probably be okay to do it. If they're a heavy vapor or something like that, you know, again, then I think it'd be reasonable to get a pulmonary consult, pulmonary function test beforehand. Um, certainly, maybe possibly a EKG uh, and um, uh, you know things like that, a cardiac workup too, maybe before you put them to sleep. And I think I'd take them probably if they're heavy vapor to a surgical center or possibly to a hospital to do them, and probably do them today because you have bronchospasm or something to treat these people from what Ed gave us, I think would be impossible, so. Yeah, what? <laughs> How do they even see driving? Like Cheech and Chong, they're all they're on pair. Did we, what did he say? Did we hit something or something? Yeah. So I don't know. It's interesting. Um, it's truly amazing that high schoolers now, middle schoolers are using this stuff, and you know they can kind of conceal it. And obviously, people buy it for them. I guess they pay them to buy it. And you know now they're trying to get regulations where they're not going to be able to sell these with these flavored things in it. So, uh, but it's really the illicit ones are really the problem with the THC. So. Um, but um, these pa patients have some serious issues with it, and you know it's just growing exponentially. So uh, in one in, in a couple of weeks, you know there was another three or four hundred of these people would be injured. And so and uh, what was it, twenty some deaths or something like that, twenty six or something. I think I looked at the other day. So um, you know, and more to come, I'm sure. Yes. Can't answer that. I don't know. No, just vapor. Doesn't smell at all. I have somebody from. I'm sorry. It's a flavor. I don't know. But I, again, I don't. I don't use it. I just see somebody pass by, and you know, we were in the restaurant, we were in the hospital, and somebody passed by, and they were doing this with the large devices. Yeah. And I kind of. I kind of smelled it. it didn't smell like it, anything at all. So yeah, you know, I guess it, you can't smell it because kids do it in school. So if you can smell it, you can eat it. You see that it has a smell. It's not much of a bud. It's a flower itself. Yeah. And it's not a it's not. So if you're starting to be seeing part of that, it's not Yeah, so. Apparently not. I don't, I don't know. But I, occasionally you'll see somebody walking and they kind of hide these things and then they'll be walking along and they just pull it out and do a couple hits on it and then they put it back or put it in their pocket. You know, it's not lit so you can shove it in your pocket or briefcase or whatever and you can use them kind of. I saw someone walking through the airport just taking a quick hit on one and then put it back in their pocket, you know. They're using them all over. So, you know, school I'm sure is prevalent, you know, place to use them. So, I don't know. I haven't done anybody that I know of, but now that I look back, I'm sure I have done some people that they, some kids that they, but um, you know, they didn't seem to have any acute lung injuries or issues with hypoxia or uh, you know decreased SATs or something like that. So um, one of the things too, it's interesting, you know, getting baseline vitals on these people now maybe it's reasonable to get a pulse oximeter reading on these kids too and just see, you know, um, how they hooked up. So uh, you know, get a blood pressure. Uh, get a uh, pulse rate and uh, get a uh, O2 set on when you bring them in for pre-op. So 
take you know take take one minute to do it so something else that's probably reasonable to do. But um, the ones that have chronic issues, you know, when they come in to get get treatment, what do you do with them? You know, other than local, you know, if you're going to do some kind of sedation, I don't know. You know, doing them in the office is probably not the greatest thing. It's, it, it's rather interesting in that uh, you're starting to see more and more reports of it. So you get people that are using marijuana for like multiple years and they end up having these episodes of multiple emesis periods like in a day or it could be over the course of a week, and then it just disappears, and then it reappears maybe a few months later, and it's all related to the chronic use of marijuana. And the thing that they'll tell you is that if they step in a shower and take a hot shower, the symptoms improve. Why? Nobody really knows, uh, but you know, you look at marijuana and there, there are like two cannabinoid receptors, cannabinoid one and two. And with chemotherapy, you can use marijuana and activate one receptor and cause anti-emesis. But if you activate the other receptor, you get emesis. And so that that's what's happening with these people. It, it, now you're going to put them to sleep and they may have... Uh, vomiting with, while you're doing your surgery. So it, it's probably a good idea to talk to these, these kids, adults, that are using marijuana to find out, number one, how much they do a day, and if they've ever experienced this. And then if you're gonna do them, it'd probably be a good idea to use on Danzatron, you know, preoperatively on them. Uh, because you, it, it, it will definitely decrease the risk of them vomiting, but uh, it's something that we never really had to see before, but it's uh, becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, if, do you guys have any uh, written protocol for somebody that comes in and says that they smoked marijuana that day and they want to get a procedure done, you know, medical legally, what's the deal? Uh, with them, you do anything special? The dental students always ask that. They come over, you know, this patient smoked today. Uh, can we do them? And it's always been mine and Mark's opinion that if uh, if they come in and they're oriented to person, place, and time, they're not staggering. It's really no different than if some guy went to the bar and had a couple of drinks before they come in. So we just go ahead and do them. But if you're going to do somebody with an anesthetic that smoked marijuana that day, uh, the problem with that is that they have an increased risk of laryngospasm for at least four hours to six hours after smoking. So now you have that added risk. So, you know, I, I've told some of these people that or definitely, you know, I'm using this every day, I'd actually rather have them, I mean, it has to fall within the NPO guidelines, but if you really need that marijuana, then why don't you gummy bear it or something before uh, you come in here uh, so that at least you get your whatever, but I'm not gonna have to worry about laryngospasm. Uh, but it's, it's rather interesting, my friend Mike Rollert's in Denver, and since everything's been legalized, they're just seeing all these bizarre reactions. Uh, you're putting people to sleep, they're not, they're not going to sleep. They're, they're wild, they're fighting you. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you use a propofol or any fentanyl, it's, it's, uh, it, it all re requires a lot of increased dosage. And you know, this is something that uh, you know, we're creating a, no, a new monster uh, for us in the office setting with these patients. Uh, you know, I guess people have a right to do what they want to do, but 
you know, it does definitely affect your anesthetic. Has anybody had any really bizarre reactions with people that are heavy smokers and then you try to put them to sleep? No? Okay. What? But yeah, it's a, it's a new pro, you know, it's, again, it's just like a new problem that's coming out of, uh, that, that we're all going to have to face. And, I mean, there, there's some really interesting things coming out with these ca cannabinoid receptors in terms of managing chronic pain and the like that, you know, more and more people will be, all, be on them, but they won't be on the THC active component at least of it. Uh, but, you know, just another thing that can affect your anesthetic. What about your people that come in that are on ADH, ADHD meds? Do you ever stop those before an anesthetic? No. No? Well, you gotta, I do. And the only reason I do is, well, number one, I'll ask them, do you ever take a drug holiday? And if they say they take a drug holiday and they don't have a problem with it, only because I'm using lidocaine with epinephrine, so most of these drugs are going to be stimulants. So I just can, uh, can avoid having another stimulant on board before we do them. Uh, but if they say that they have a problem with, that they can't take drug holidays, then yeah, but we'll do them with, uh, with them on their meds. But there are some case reports out there that you, know, you definitely can see some increases in blood pressure and heart rate when you're doing these people if they're on their ADHD meds. And I, I think you use them as a patient to take a stop, take, take a drug holiday. I just tell them, I just tell them that just hold it the, the, that, that day, yeah, the day before. Yeah, and that's, that's the only, well, the only problem they have. I, cocaine a big issue out in this part of the state? No. no. Heroin you know, more. You know, the big thing we tell the dental students is, you know, they, it's, when can you treat those patients? So if someone comes in and says, yeah, we're a heavy coke, yeah, I'm a coke, I'm a coke guy, and uh, I do coke every day. You know, we tell them, hey, look, you know, he says, but I didn't do it today, doc. So they say to the students, okay, that's fine. Go back and tell them that, oh, I'm glad you didn't do it today, because if you did do it today, and we give you this lidocaine with epinephrine in it, we could kill you and then hopefully at least they'll be honest with you but you know you have to wait at least six six plus hours if they've used the cocaine acutely before you can use anything with epinephrine in it but that's the only problem the other thing is if there there are a cokehead on those patients you definitely should get a 12 week EKG preoperatively on them because they have significant increases in left ventricular hypertrophy with with cardiac issues uh, after that so someone who's a chronic cocaine user, even if they stopped for a few years, the damage has already been done. So you ought to really should get a 12 EKG. Anybody have any other uh, things you want to talk about? Otherwise, we'll wrap this one up. We had uh, blood dyscrasias years ago. You never presented it for a couple of years. Implication and anesthesia. Oh, well, no, we haven't. Um, would you do it for next time? Today? No, yeah. next time. Oh, next time. Yeah, sure. Send me an email. I'll, okay. I'll put it. Okay. Hey, I, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. If you have any, any other kind of questions,